This is episode number 117 featuring Al Bond and Jessica Bellis from the Avalon Foundation, which puts on Plen Air Easton. You don't want to miss this one. This is the Plen Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plein Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric, and today is going to be a little bit different. Normally, we do artist interviews. Sometimes it's a curator or a museum professional. But today, I thought you'd find it interesting to go behind the scenes of a major Plein Air event. Plein Air Easton will be celebrating its 15th year this summer, and it's become known as the premier event in the Plein Air events circle. So I thought it'd be fun to interview the two people who have made the magic happen. But not only that, uh, we'll talk about what makes a good event, what are the best practices for event organizers, but also for artists. And we're going to talk about the whole world of Plein Air from their perspective. You don't want to miss this one. This is good. Also, I've invited Al and Jessica from the Plein Air Easton group to be on stage at the Plein Air convention with me coming up this uh, April. Also, I have Jean Stern from the Irvine Museum at the University of California, Elaine Adams, uh, the director of the American Legacy Fine Art Gallery, and Peter Adams, her husband, and the president of the California Art Club, two very influential people. We're going to be talking about the plein air movement, where it stands, where it's going, and what we can all do to assure a solid future. And you don't want to miss that. And also, that's going to be on stage at the plein air convention. Plus, we have 88 instructors now, 88 instructors and faculty members at the plein air convention. So you don't want to miss it. This is not the one to miss. Don't miss this one. Man, this is just, don't miss it. There are some seats left. And new for this year, uh, those who don't want to go outdoors and paint, we have a new indoor painting arena. We had some people who said, I don't want to deal with traffic. I don't want to deal with parking. I don't want to deal with big city issues. And so if you want to come to the hotel, just get in your cab or your Uber, go straight to the hotel, all day long instruction. And we also have a lot of painters now who are coming who are not necessarily plein air painters, but they want to watch these famous artists and understand how they do things. And so uh, some of those people aren't going to go out and do plein air painting with us when we go out in the afternoons every day. So we have this indoor painting arena, which has big screen video, HD video, and you can just sit there and paint from that if you want to, or just paint around the hotel. That's okay, too. Anyway, uh, we also have this year transportation to paint outs. Uh, we have buses. You have to make your reservations in advance before you come to the convention. you got to get your tickets. We have like three bus packages, but one bus package is just the daily paintouts in San Francisco. And then the other one is all the paintouts, including wine country and San Francisco. And then there's one for just wine country alone if you want to go up on that because that's about an hour away. Anyway, you got to make those reservations in advance. You will find that out in your notifications after you've signed up. There is no excuse not to come to the plein air convention this year, all right? I also want to remind you that our annual plein air salon art competition will be awarded at the plein air convention, but it closes any day now, like right away, depending on when you're listening to this, just a couple of days from when this is posted. So this is your last chance to enter any painting you've done and it doesn't have to be a fresh painting. It doesn't have to be from this year. Any painting you've done, you can enter it in the competition right away. But we have to get it done early. We're not doing our normal end-of-month closing because we have to get it ready for the plein air convention so we can write those big checks. You know, $23,000 in total cash prizes, including 15000 
for the grand prize winner, who also gets the cover of Planner Magazine. And, of course, instant fame, great way to get your career rocking and rolling. You can enter and do it do it now. Enter at plenairsalon.com. Also, coming up after the interview, I'll be doing some art marketing questions in the Marketing Minute. Let's first get right to our interview. These are smart, smart people. I'm very honored to have them on the show. Al Bond and Jessica Bellis of Plen Air Easton and the Avalon Foundation. Al Bond and Jessica Bellis, welcome to the Plen Air Podcast. We're so happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much for having us. Well, I should properly introduce you. Al, you're the president and CEO of the Avalon Foundation. That's correct. Yep. And Jessica, you're the COO and CFO of the Avalon Foundation, right? You nailed it. Yep. What the heck is the Avalon Foundation? The Avalon Foundation is the largest arts organization on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of programs from, yeah, we put on about 160 live music performances per year. We run the local, you know, Fourth of July and farmers market and and all kinds of sort of outdoor activities. We have a little television station in the basement that yeah is the public access television station for Talbot County. So it's it's all sorts of things. But yeah, today we're here to talk about the fact that the Avalon Foundation runs Plein Air Easton, which is the largest outdoor painting competition in the United States. Well, congratulations. Uh, Plan Air Easton is going to be turning 15 this summer. Yeah, next year they're going to let us drive. <laughs> 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 Always a comedian in the group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. Yeah, 15 years. Can you believe it? We certainly live in a uh, area that has the elements that are necessary for a successful event. We've got great geography, the you know, demographic has a level of affluence that can afford to buy art. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we're sort of in a good place. It's a beautiful landscape, but we're also, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes from DC and Baltimore, two hours from Philly and three from New York City. So we're really um, a beautiful commutable place from a lot of um, metropolitan areas. And then I guess the, the last piece of it is where a lot of uh, plein air festivals really are formed by either a small art club or, or a gallery a or group yeah, a group of volunteers. Yeah, the Avalon Foundation fundamentally is in the events business. So we have the sort of bench yeah, in our yeah, in our human resources to organize a really large and complicated event. And yeah, you know, as a startup, most organizations don't have that. So how many people does it take to put on the event, including volunteers and employees? I mean, we have we have thirteen employees that work um, for our, our nonprofit organization, and basically for the month of July, their main focus moves from you know concert promotion or some of the other community focused activities that they do the other eleven months of the year, and they're really focused on the event itself. And we have a community of probably close to 250 volunteers that step up and um, work at the actual festival. And we probably have um, 25 to 30 that work all year round on making sure that the festival happens, you know, committee chairs and uh, um, event heads that work to make it happen. And that doesn't even count our host families and um, other businesses that participate in the festival. So it really is a full community lift. But again, I think a, a differentiating factor is that some of that lift is um, orchestrated by paid employees, which I think gives us a huge edge. So you guys have a lot of things going on. So why do a plein air event? It seems like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand, is this a, a fundraiser for the Avalon Foundation? Or is it really more just a cool thing to do for your community? The, Much more the, the latter. The, the, the latter. Um, you know, one of the things that is true about the Avalon Foundation you know, in terms of our mission, yeah, it is in, to, yeah, to create a vibrant community. And we use arts and culture in order to do that. So, yeah, and certainly there are you know, plein air festivals out there that are intended to raise money for some cause. Yeah, plein air is the cause for us. And yeah, essentially, we reinvest the dollars that come in through art sales and through yeah contributions from the public into the festival. 
So, you know, we're we're capitalizing this event in a way that I think is unusual also. But also has led to its sustainability because, you know, again, it's not while it, it is a profitable event for the Avalon Foundation as a whole, it, it's designed to cover its own costs. And, and when we are successful, we're able to reinvest in the event, which I think is how we've been able to. Um, sustain such interest for such a long period of time because we're always adding new activities, new concepts, new um, parties or gallery sales, new partnerships. So how did this all begin? Was there like you guys are sitting around in a room and said, hey, this plein air thing is happening. Let's create an event. What was the seed of all of this? So it, it happened in, in stages for me. Um, the owner at the time of the uh, South Street Gallery was a woman named uh, Patricia Spitaleri. And she uh, made a meeting with me uh, as at that t point, I was the economic development director for the town of Easton. And she introduced me to a guy who was the chief conservator for the National Gallery and a avid plein air painter named Ross Merrill. And they made the case that Easton would be a great place to have a plein air festival. Yeah, while I really didn't know much about plein air at that time, yeah, it, I was looking for an event that was, yeah, was representational art related because we have a lot of resource in the in the community. And and the thing that really grabbed my attention was the notion that. Plein air is experienced not just as the final painting on the wall by the public, but also as the artistic and creative process happening, unfolding right in front of you. Smell the and, turpentine. Yeah, you, you can yeah, see what the artist is seeing. You can see the decisions that they're making with their brush. You can yeah, ask them questions as long as you're not yeah, stopping their process yeah, too much. Yeah, you, 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 it is a much more immersive way of experiencing yeah, two-dimensional art than is true in most cases. And it really occurred to me that especially yeah, the baby boomers, yeah, want to engage in their leisure activities in a way that is, yeah, where they're really much more part of it, not just, yeah, observing it. So it, it seemed to me that there was some real potential in it. And yeah, it wasn't until Nancy Tankersley bought the South Street Gallery from Patricia uh, about a year later that, and, and really came back with some concrete experience of the big California yeah, events that we we really got things going. So that was 2005. And um, yeah, we had our first yeah, meeting in January. And in July, we had an event. And I think that, you know, um, one of the things, again, we're back to that differentiating sort of piece is at the time, Al, like you said, was the head of economic development. And instead of the Downtown Merchants Association jumping on board and taking over this pro process or the Academy Art Museum being the nonprofit um, force behind it, you know, Al really approached the Avalon Foundation and its community building mission and said, hey, you're the one who's in the events business. You know, you know how to throw music festivals. Help me throw a different kind of festival. There's still going to be great art. There's still going to be crowds to manage. There's right. still going to be all of the logistical details. Um, but, but how can you help me execute that? And that was how it all began. Yep, pretty much. Well, how many people do you draw to the festival now? Yeah, well, as you know, running an outdoor yeah, activity that is spread Free and all open over to the, the public. <laughs> yeah, exact counts are difficult, but um, we estimate yeah that it is between six and eight thousand people uh, each year that are participating in the event in some way. Yeah, whether that be that they're there at the quick draw or they're at one of the many other sort of smaller events that happen over the course of about a week and a half. Um, you know, throw them all into one bucket, and that's about the magnitude of it. Can you uh, can you say how much money you generate in terms of sales? Yeah, last year we actually uh, yeah, hit a, a new benchmark. Uh, we we uh, exceeded four hundred thousand dollars in art sales. And uh, what percentage of that do the artists get to keep? 
It depends on the event where the art is produced. You know, we have we are juried competitions, so we have 58 juried artists, and they make a, a a deal with us that we'll have the more traditional 60 40 split that you would maybe get in a gallery. But we also have a lot of opportunities for other people to register and paint out as a part of our event. And if you participate in the quick draw, for example, then it's a 75 25 split. So, in other words, if I'm an artist and I'm not registered for the show as one of the artists, I can still come and paint in Easton, right? You know, Absolutely. I think that it is, everybody sort of says that it feels like summer camp. I think that people who enjoy coming to your conference, people who are looking to to make connections, to get connected to galleries and collectors, to see a lot of great free educational content, traveling to Easton is a really great idea. And we have a lot of structured events, a, a nocturne paint out, um, a, a quick draw. We've got two days of uh, rehearse quick draw competition where you can come and practice and then have your, your quick draw pieces critiqued by other plein air painters. There are opportunities to come here and paint and sell, even if you are not one of those 58 artists. And there, it's certainly a great opportunity for you to connect with a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about plein air painting. Let me raise a sensitive subject I'm kind of curious about because it comes up. There's this notion if somebody is associated with a show, but they're not maybe a well-cooked painter or maybe they're just not quite ready yet. There are some shows that would say, absolutely not. We only want juried painters in the show because they don't want to send a signal that the painters they have are not all of a certain level of quality. How do you address that or do you or does it matter? Oh, we certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's there's kind of two yeah pieces to that. One is we are not an invitational, we are a juried event as it relates to the main competition. And so we welcome everybody to apply. And then we put a lot of attention into the person that is our juror so that we get a really well-qualified look at the images that are that are being yeah, put forth. And, and the notion there is we want to see the cream rise to the top. And certainly many of the same artists get into plenary Easton year after year, even though we have a different juror every year. But we also get those new people that you know, have the capacity, but maybe are not you know, well known on the scene, the breakout artists that wows everybody. Um, so we, we think of ourselves as it relates to the competition as being a meritocracy. So, you know, the a lot of those new faces end up being you know, kind of nationally recognized as a result of getting their first chance at Plenar Easton. Um, the, the other piece of it, though, is in our quick draw where all you need, need is yeah, $10 in ambition to participate. Um, our notion really is that when you see what the best plein air painters in the nation are capable of doing in yeah in two hours and then you look at what that yeah new painter that is just getting their feet under them can do in the same time period yeah it is apparent to where where the talent is you know i don't think that it it i don't think it pulls the the top people down at all to be compared to people that they're better than and you know, I would, I would, I always like to to point out, and and Eric, we've had conversations about this. You know, marketing tips that you can give to artists along the way. And what I would say is, you know, if you are out there as a professional plein air painter and you are participating in events that have um, more more amateur or pro am painters involved, you are really acting as an example and an ambassador. But you are also creating a group of fans and collectors who will likely follow you. And the more engaged you can be with people who are interested in art and having art in their lives, the more the more you can be a teacher and a mentor. I think the more popular your art can become. You know, we talked about this the last time you that we, we the three of us spoke. So many of our collectors that support those almost half a million dollars worth of art sales from last year are people who are tr trying to be some level of artists themselves. They're trying to reconnect with a passion that maybe they had in college and and let go. They are the people who are in, you know engaged in your pace your pace. Um, 
um, conference or are taking the workshops that are being offered. So, you know, I think being really open to having amateurs painting alongside of you is a way to really both um, bolster and build your career. Well, absolutely. I, and I think we should talk about that because this is a good opportunity to bring this up. We talked about this at the uh, plein air convention a couple of years ago. I asked the people in the room, there are probably 800 or 1,000 people in the room, and I asked, uh, raise your hand if you've purchased, not traded, but purchased one painting in the last year, and almost every hand went up. And then I asked again, you know, if, keep your hand up. It was three paintings, almost every hand was up. You know, there, and, and then five paintings, some hands went down. But one of the things that I realized is that the people who were in the room who are plein air painters are also buying paintings. They're collectors. We're seeing this melding where the collector is becoming the artist or the artist is becoming the collector. And it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, we, we deal with this every day at the magazine because plein air magazine is an artist for collectors and for people who are in the plein air community as artists because they're really one. You know, you have these people who go around the country who travel to various plein air events as collectors. They like to go and see what's going on. They like to see the artists. They like to know what's going on. So they're subscribers and they're collectors. But because the magazine also has this function of training artists and articles about how to paint, there's this assumption that the artist uh, that the magazine is all about um, for artists. And, and it's just not the case because really it's one, one big community. The artist and the collector are one. And now we're seeing this really happening a lot more. The, the difference uh, in, in this magazine is that, you know, these are people who travel the country to look at painters and they like to watch them paint on location. So the how-to element of the magazine isn't just for artists. It's for collectors as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I o couldn't agree more. Overwhelmingly. And yeah, the, again, that, that person who is just yeah, getting started with plein air. Yeah. Um, the people who are the competition artists, particularly the ones that have a, an established brand. Yeah. They're really looking to those. Yeah. Those yeah, rock star artists, we'll call them yeah, as their inspiration. And yeah, Nobody wants to go out and not be yeah, uh, yeah, in the league with their peers. So the, the notion of yeah, mixing it up with some of the, the top people actually makes for better plein air painters um, yeah, across the board. And, and just yeah. to just to like reiterate something that Al said earlier in this in this conversation, you know, this plein air collecting, being an active plein air painting, painting, being a collector of plein air painting is an active and an immersive experience. You want to be able to sit in your dining room and talk to the people you have over about the where and the when and the how and the who of the art that is on your wall. It is a it is an active collecting experience, not a passive one where you might stumble into a gallery and really feel moved by a particular artist or, or piece of work. I think a lot of the people who are collecting plein air paintings are both connected Connecting to the artists themselves, connecting with the subject matter themselves, and are often present at some point in that painting's creation. And so, again, it, it is it is about the the active connection and the and the love of of that immersive experience that I think has made plein air painting so exciting. And I always go back to the sports analogies. Not everybody who's out there playing golf believes that they're ever going to make it to the Masters, but it doesn't mean that they don't love a good game. Well, as you know, plein air is the new golf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've been saying it for years. <laughs> you know, I think this is really interesting because uh, the more people who come to these events, the more people who decide to take up plein air painting. And yet they're still buying. As a matter of fact, once they start painting, they buy more paintings because they now appreciate what it took to create it and and uh, want to have that so they can look at and study it. Absolutely. They get more educated. They get to be a more educated consumer. Yep. I would agree. Talk to me about uh, best practices for artists. You've had 15 years of dealing with artists and, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Every possible scenario, like probably artists who have come but have never 
got invited back because of things that they do. <laughs> hmm. Yep. Okay, so there's no cronyism whatsoever. So if somebody totally like screws you over, they still can get invited back. Don't rem remember, we're a juried competition. So there's none of that hinky. Um, we're not like, there's no cronyism here. If you submit your slides and the jurist chooses you, you get to come. You cannot, you cannot apply. That's a good way not to get in. But you can get in if you apply. How many uh, how many images do they have to submit? Here, here's I, I just want everybody like so that I'm being completely transparent. We have a few invitations. If you win the first place, second place, third place, you're the winner of the quick draw, or you are the winner of the artist choice award. So those are five slots. You get an automatic in for the next year. That is the only way that you can get invited back. So yes, if one of those people was a real jerk, we would still have to invite them back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's how you get your invite. And otherwise, you are juried in blindly by somebody looking by at the three slides. a different person every single right, year. Right, a different person so. every year by the slides that you submit. And that makes us really different from a lot of the other large plein air painting competitions across the nation. And we're, yeah, I'll be honest with you, yeah, although I won't name any names, there certainly are some people that are not, you know, particularly ones that I, you know, favor <laughs> that, you know, have the chops and get in over and over again. You know, that is, you know, that's a real thing. So you, you said know. advice, and here's yeah. the first piece that I would give. I would say that if you are somebody who is participating in a competition, whether it be big or small, you need to have a positive public facing attitude. And that does not mean that you shouldn't provide um, criticism or complaints to the people who are organizing this event, these events. I think that especially constructive feedback is awesome. Some of our best ideas have come from artists, but I think that you praise in public and you criticize in private. And I would say that if you um, are, are choosing to enter the competition circuit and the weather is lousy or you're having a bad day or you feel like it is it is disorganized, standing around and griping about it is a really terrible way to encourage people to buy your artwork. And I think that the consumer feels that energy and they don't want to bring that energy in and hang it up on their walls. So if you are standing at an event and griping about that event and you're standing in front of your artwork and then you complain that your sales weren't strong, I can pretty much tell you why that is. So that would be a... That would there, be my takeaway that I would uh, deliver. There is definitely a correlation between art sales and yeah, attitude. an attitude that is outside of the the pure yeah aesthetic quality of the the paintings. Um, I would I would back it up a little bit and say, if you are interested in getting into a high quality painting competition, make sure that the images that you are sending are both your best work and your and have been photographed by a professional. Absolutely. It makes such a difference and and unfortunately I see this, you know, that there are times that really top painters, I mean let's face it, there are more than 58 really talented plein air painters in the world. Not everybody gets to get into our event every year and there are some really talented people that get left on the sideline every single year. And, you know, when I go back and look through, because I can you know, access those you know, slides that the you know, juror sees, sometimes I look at it and I think like, guy, what were you thinking putting right, that there? Right. I know you're a better painter than that. I've seen your work. <laughs> read, so, read the like, descriptions, upload the proper DPIs and the proper sizes. It is what the jurist is looking at. And you've got to be putting your best foot forward every so, single time. You know. So let's just explore this scenario. So you've got somebody who submits, they've given you three great paintings because they went to three great workshops and the workshop instructor worked on all three of those paintings and probably did most of the painting. The three best paintings they've ever done in their life, but they didn't, of course, really do them. They get there and they can't really live up to the ability to paint. Has that ever happened to you? We certainly have had people that have got come have made it into our festival based on the quality of the images that they submitted and really did not have the level of yeah you know, competency that yeah you know, our festival enjoys. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, that does happen. And typically those people really, you know, again, just because we sell 400 and some thousand dollars of paintings does not mean that every single person competing in our competition sells paintings. Yeah. And it, and pretty much every year there are two or three that don't. Right. And, and it's, and it's even like more brutal than that, Eric, especially when, you know, the competition is so fierce at Easton and people do have to bring their A game. It is, it is serious business for every one of those artists. And we can have former grand prize winners who just have a lousy week, who are having a hard time getting their feet under them, who have mishaps out on the field or just they get in their own head. And, you know, we always laugh at like sometimes if you're the grand prize winner, the year after you're the grand prize winner, you have a really lousy year at Plein Air Easton because I think you're all kind of up in your head and you psych yourself out. And if you don't create your best work at Plein Air Easton, somebody else will do it better. Than absolutely. You. And the sales will go to them. So uh, what about best practices? I, you know, I've never been to your event because I'm always up in the Adirondacks and, you know, maybe I'll try to make it this year. We'd love for you to come out. You have, a, you have an you... open invitation, but I also know how important it is to enjoy those kids while they're still at home. So, yeah. In terms of best practices though, are these artists standing there, beside their paintings, trying to sell their paintings? And if so, the ones who do well, what do they do differently? You're not responsible for selling your artwork. We, you know, one of the things, I'm going to go back to things that differentiate Plein Air Easton. We have very few requirements that we require our artists to do. We have very few events that they are required to show up at and participate in. We've got a lot of optional events for them to come and engage in if they're looking for something to do. And some of the artists choose to participate and some do not. But, you know, we're really the ones who are out there, our volunteers, that big team of 200 plus volunteers. It's really our responsibility to to market and get those collectors in and get those purchases um purchases made it's we really it's the artist's job to produce the beautiful artwork and i really see it as our job to promote and sell it i think my, my comment about the attitude and how that differentiates is you know i think that there are certainly artists who are better salesmen than other artists and that doesn't even mean that there are top sellers but i do think that if you are engaging in the community it increases the odds that you're in a positive way. If you're engaging right. in a positive way with the community, it increases your chances of having strong sales. Now, another tough question. You know, pricing is always an issue at shows, and I've heard of, of situations where an artist will come into a show, uh, equal quality artist, who will lower his or her prices so much that they sell out of everything, and then the other artists don't sell anything. How do you feel about that or how do you deal with that? We are, are really like, we are very, ask anyone who's been to Plein Air Easton and it was like how I get on my soapbox every time. I'll remind you that my uh, job here is being the chief financial officer. So it's really important for me to keep an eye on the numbers. And, you know, we cannot say more, we cannot say enough, use your gallery pricing when you're at these events. And, you know, I'll quote one of your podcasts, Eric, you know, people are smart these days. And if you have anything that is on the internet that has pricing on it, they're looking it up and they're fact checking what you're putting in front of them like you're not dealing with um stupid buyers and the information is out there and if you are pricing lower than your gallery pricing you are just um offending your collectors and the organizations that are running these events and, and your fellow artists for that matter i mean Absolutely. i think that the uh, the plein air community really yeah the artist community that is really calls out those people that you know lowball their pricing you know, we've had actually an the interesting reverse, reverse thing here. happen, which <laughs> is because our art sales are so strong, we've had yeah, a problem with artists raising their prices when they're in Easton, which I can tell you is equally offensive to the uh, collector uh, out there. Totally. So, so, um, so here's whose pricing you should use. You should use your gallery pricing, not your favorite artist gallery pricing, mm -hmm. not like what your roommate's gallery pricing is. You need to use your own gallery pricing because that's the only way to be fair to your collectors. And over time, you should be working to make that price higher. Absolutely. Yeah. And don't ever take a step backwards. Ever. Do you set any minimums? Uh, we don't. Nope. Yeah, um, it is rare for there to be uh, paintings that are under $600. 
once in a long while that will happen. But that's all the artists yeah, making decisions, not us telling them what they have to do. And we've sold um, a $10,000 plein air piece at our festival before. So, you know, if you're painting your best painting and you know your gallery pricing and you know that it's good, you should be pricing it at whatever whatever the, the, the square inch calculus you is for you. You should be pricing it at what it's worth. Absolutely. And, and don't be afraid of, you know, uh, of the, yeah, um, the notion, uh, again, the, the, the notion that you're going to reduce your pricing and make that rent check is such a short term. Yeah. Yeah. Thought and yeah, not a strategic way to approach your pricing. And Eric, I'll go one step further and say, it's not just use your gallery pricing, but it's also stay true to, to your gallery pricing. You know, we are a festival that does not allow any negotiation, negotiating or discounting. I think that that is a really bad idea for anybody who's running a festival and for the artists who are there, you know, if, if on the Sunday, people know that the prices get slashed on the inventory, or if you're trying to run back deals out of your your car on the way out of town, you train your buyers not to value the artwork that you are creating. Good point. Um, so one of the things that I find really fascinating about the two of you is that you're very open about best practices. If somebody's launching an event, you're willing to share best practices to help them succeed. Let's talk about the the role, our role, my role, your role, the collective community role of keeping the plein air movement, the plein air community healthy and working together on those things. Right. So, you know, we talked about it a little bit in terms of our approach to how do we you know, think about you know, beginning artists and you know, having them interacting with the top artists. You know, we really see it as a, we are nurturing quality across everything that we can do. Um, and we're not going to tell other festivals how they should run their event. Yeah, we do think that the for us, that the quality of the entire experience is critically important to making to elevating the artwork. That is to say that where do you show the artwork? Is the lighting high quality? Is the yeah the yeah events that you're having are are they well run and the public is able to access it in a way that is that is enjoyable? You know you don't want to have lines. You don't want to have. There's a million ways that you can create an environment where the consumer, the collector, is able to actually see how great these paintings are. So you know. What we encourage when we're talking to other festivals is seeing how they can bring that element into their own festival. And what works in Easton is not necessarily going to work someplace else. But that guiding principle of the quality of everything matters, yeah, is is one of our it's well, we have three guiding principles. That's one of them. The other one is that we put a whole lot more of our time in marketing. And in you know, decision making around making sure that the artists are happy, because we believe that you know, if artists have a great experience at our event, that two things are going to be true. They're going to tell their collecting public that it's a great event and that they should be a part of it. And they're also going to tell all their artist friends that it's a great event and they should be part of it. And yeah, that really brings the that, that that feedback loop brings more and more quality artists to the event and and ensures that sales are happening. So the you know the make the artists happy, the quality of everything matters. And then the last one really has to do with partners. Um, we we mentioned that we are a staff of 13 people, which sounds like a lot for you know, plein air, you know, a lot of plein air events. But when you think about the the scale of what we actually do, yeah, it takes not just all those volunteer partners, but a whole lot of other organizations within our community add content to the to Plenary Easton. So the Working Artists Forum, for example, is a group of working artists that yeah you know, put on a show and have a whole slew of demos with national yeah you know, nationally known yeah you know, painters. 
um, it would be just one of probably, I would say, 30 or so other you know, organizations or businesses that are adding content to the event. And the thing that you have to make sure with your partners, because every single one of them, whether it be a volunteer or another arts organization or whatever it is, there's something that they want to get out of their participation and you better know what that is and you better deliver it. So, you know, the partners should get what they want out of you know, adding content. And that's how we've been able to bring this huge sort of coalition of, uh, of you know, entities, we'll call it, into the event and make the content so rich. And I guess I, I love that uh, that Al shared our, our three principles with 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 you. And they're certainly the ones that we have adhered to from the beginning. And I think that they're really important. But I, I, I'm going to actually just take it back bigger and back to earlier in our conversation and just say, you know, we are all in this together and we are in it because we love art and we love community and we um, have built relationships with one another. And I feel like it's our responsibility to work together to create more opportunities to to cultivate these relationships and grow the modern plein air movement. It is how we will all continue to be sustainable and also how we'll continue to enjoy the healthy community of artists that has been established. So, you know, there's no greater compliment to me than when I see one of my own typos on somebody else's website. And I've taken a lot of time talking to small organizations or talking to artists who want to participate or have different ideas. And again, I'm not saying that Plenary Easton has all the answers. I've spent the last two weeks every day talking to two plein air artists a day about some of the new ideas we have for plein air Easton. And it's because I feel like they've got the ideas and I just need to talk to them about it. And I'll call them up and say, what do you think about this? And sometimes they say, Jessica, that's a terrible idea. And here's why. But what about this? And that's how we're building the new content for our festival is, is that we all have to be in it together. And and the thing that I don't know that everybody has the full connection on is that's essential to art sales, which is what sort of sustains a huge part of this this movement. So it's back to making sure that those educational opportunities are there because the people there are a lot of people who want to pick up a paintbrush and also hang a painting in their house. What is the worst possible thing that happens from your perspective at some plein air events that really shouldn't occur. I think that, again, if you walk away from your event, I'm going to go to Al's guiding principle number two. If you walk away from your event and the artists that participated are unhappy for really any reason, you're really sunk. Because I think that, um, and, and what leads to them being unhappy, it can be all, a whole mess of logistical things or even circumstances outside of your control. But if you walk away with artists saying, Phew, we're never going to do that event again, that would be the worst case scenario. So uh, there was a show. It was a national show. It was considered one of the best shows that attracted the very, very best artists. And it had a really great reputation, but for whatever reason, maybe from pressure from their board or some other such thing, they decided they wanted to be more inclusive. They wanted to include more artists who were maybe not at the same level, so they were maybe not vetted in as strongly, or maybe they were including some locals uh, who they wanted to make sure were part of the show that didn't really, would have not been vetted in. And it was interesting because the show imploded, exploded overnight. Imploded, I guess is the right word, because what happened is uh, the first year they did that and they brought the quality down, the word got out and none of the other good artists wanted to participate in the show anymore. And so it snowballed and they had to get lesser and lesser quality artists as a result. And it just completely destroyed the show. I, I've never watched a show die so fast. I mean, all of a sudden the quality went down and people stopped coming. And, and, they, and they spent years trying to get people to come back and people weren't coming back. And, and I don't think the show has still ever come back, even though they've reached out and tried to get really more quality. I mean, once they set the tone that the quality wasn't good, word got out and it just kind of destroyed the, the reputation of the show. 
Well, I guess the part of it is, is again, you, like, I don't know what led to that, them making that decision in that moment in time, but I would say we're pretty careful in when we make big sweeping decisions for the, for Plein Air Easton to take a, a real careful survey and not just in writing, but pick up the phone and actually talk to people and talk to our various stakeholders. I'll go back to, to, to primary principle number three, that you've got to make sure that your partners are getting what they want out of your festival. So, you know, if you were going to make a, a, a decision to allow a whole bunch of new artists in, you better make sure that the artists that are most important to you are enthusiastic about that move before making it makes sense um you know and the the tricky thing is eric is that people will lie to you and tell you what what they think you want to hear and they're not always being honest about what it is or why it is that they they feel a certain way i mean it was a, 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 right before our 10th year i'll share this with you our our, our ninth i guess it was our ninth year no, it was our 10th year. It was the hottest year we had. Like five mm. of the seven days broke all-time historical heat index records. And it was miserable. Like uh, it was the hottest I have ever been in my whole life. And we said, okay, well, we've had 10 years of Plein Air Easton in July. Maybe it's time for us to move this whole dang thing to a more pleasant month in, in Easton. And during the festival, when it was so hot, everyone was like, this is just unbearable. There's no way that we can ever do this festival again. We're not going to apply. And so afterwards, we took a careful survey, both in writing and then with follow up phone calls to the artists who had participated and said, OK, well, we're seriously considering because we've had 10 years in July. Let's do the next 10 years in May or October or something like that. And without an exception in private, the artists told us you have had the strongest sales you've ever had. Please don't mess up the momentum that you have going please don't move the festival to another week, like stay exactly where you are. So even though in the moment they were all griping and to our faces, telling us to move the festival, when we took the time when to carefully speak to them, they were like, actually, we're not so sure it's a good idea you move your festival at all. So talk to me about the impact of artist brand. You know, I teach artist branding. I tell artists that their brand is really important. They need to keep their brand visible. They need to keep it high. And a lot of, a lot of it falls on deaf ears. But talk to me about artist brand from the perspective of a show. Do those things matter to you? How important really is it? Well, Eric, the first thing I'll say is, yeah, just because you're a great artist does not mean you have any skill at all in managing your brand. Um, we've seen people who are yeah, really excellent and yeah, not be able to make a living doing what they're best at. And we've seen people who candidly are not always the best who have been really you know, fin financially successful because they have been so good at managing their brand. And yeah, the ideal, of course, is that you uh, are you know, able to do both. Um, you know, I think that if you are a working artist, you had better be thinking about your brand Absolutely. and you should and you should be out there all the time. You know, the social media is so important at this point in, in terms of that. But, you know, you've got to have your face in the place. You got to have your face in the place at, at events. You got to have your, you know, you know, streamlined pu publishing has you know, an awful lot of artists that, that you know, buy ads yeah, they should be. You right. should be front of mind for the public as much as you possibly can. And and again, you don't start at the very top. Yeah, it takes time. You've got to work on that brand. But it is, yeah, it is something that you should think of as being like brushing your teeth. Like you've got to maintain yourself and your brand over your whole career. Uh, and the people that are, are engaged in that way and seeing it from that standpoint, that it is a, a constant maintenance, are the ones that ultimately uh, succeed. Absolutely. I mean, if you get into Plein Air Easton, because we've been a show that's been around for so long, I can tell you the very first thing that our patron level and high level collectors do is they look down that list 
for all the new names. They highlight the new names and they immediately are going into their search engines and clicking through to their websites to find out the who's who and who they should be excited about. And if you don't have a website that really um, helps to credentialize who you are and you don't have examples of your work out there and available and easy to find on the website and on, on the internet, you know, I think if you have a, a, a simple name that there's a thousand of you out there, you have got to have a way that when people um, pop into Google that they can find you. Because I know that at, at an event like Easton, just making it in is not necessarily enough, the the collectors already know who they're going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for their favorites, who they want to continue to add to their collection. And they're looking for the new best thing. I mean, that's why you come to Easton is to see the new fresh faces and see how the trends change over time. And, you know, the, the, the buyers are planning their attack before your boots are even on the ground. So much so that, you know, there is real competition among the host families to get the hot new Absolutely. artist in to, to stay with them. And how are they figuring you know, it out? They're, they're going that, online. They're planning it out months and months before you ever show up. Yep. So you've got to really, if you if you get juried in, you got to have your act together and your branding together before you even apply. Because if you don't, it's not going to work to your favor once you get there. One of the things that I think that artists tend to do is they tend to think that, you know, having a website is having a brand. No, no, you, it, it is. It is a, one of the things that you have to have. You have to have it, but you have to have a way to make it give you credibility. I was looking at uh, Clyde Aspavig's website last night and I was looking at it and it had all the shows and all the awards and all the magazine articles and all these things that lend credibility and those things don't just happen because, you you know, just because you have a website, you have to have a brand so that you get invited to those events so that you can win those awards so you can get those magazine articles. It kind of it kind of starts with building your brand first. Right. Mm -hmm. Creden credentializing right. third party endorsements. But again, it's the it's the proverbial face in the place that gets people to look you up and go to your website. It's useless if you can't drive traffic to it. And that is, you know, all of the other elements of marketing that are, you know, so essential. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't have to tell you, Eric, but it's, you know, it's, it's still Facebook and it's still Instagram. And there are a lot of people sitting on their tablets and at their desks who are thumbing through those pictures and their posts every day. And I think as an artist, you have to really carefully manage your brand. And if you are going to be yourself out on Facebook, you got to watch the things that you post and you have to be thoughtful about the conversations that you want to engage in. And you have to be thoughtful about the artwork that you put out there, that you're putting your best foot forward and, you know, creating the quality brand that you want to be seen as because everybody's watching. I'm watching, you know? Right. I mean, to that point, there's a line at which you should consider not crossing. That line, if you cross, will hurt you as an artist. You know, and I think that line, uh, you have to remember, you're going to offend half the people if you're talking about politics or you, you know, maybe you're talking about religion or you're talking things that are polarizing or, you know, those pictures of you at a party with your head in the toilet. You know, you can't take that stuff back. You know, you, you know, you got a collector that's looking at that saying, you know, maybe this is not the kind of person I want to support. Sure. And, you know, that one collector could make your career. Or if you or if you can't help yourself from posting that drunken binge photo, then just make sure that that is on your personal Facebook page and that you really co carefully curate your 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 privacy settings and your your friend groups. Because I think it is really hard to be in a in a persona where you are your own brand, but maybe you want to still have a personal life. I mean, I, I worry about that with my own. I'm not an artist, but I certainly am out in the community a lot. And I think about the pictures that I post of my children, for example, you know, I think about the privacy settings that are on there and whose friendship I accept. I don't accept anybody's friendship unless I've actually met them and know them, but that would not be the right move necessarily if I was an artist trying to build a, a larger community or following. Well, one of my concerns is that we have artists putting things out there that kind of are like, hey, look at me, look at what I can do. And they're showing progress shots and they might, you know, type in the text, hey, this is, you know, three quarters done or I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm working on this. The problem is if they have collectors on their Facebook sites, which is a whole nother 
thing that we need to talk about because Facebook is only distributing 7% to your, your followers. And most artists' followers are not um, collectors. But anyway, collectors go in, they see a painting, it doesn't look good to them. Maybe it looks good to a fellow artist because you're making progress. It doesn't look good to them. And so they instantly judge you as not being as good a painter as you should be. And that's why I think we need to be careful about progress shots because nobody reads anything. They just look at pictures. They scroll through, look at pictures. They see a bad painting. They associate it to your name. And all of a sudden, it, it degrades your brand. So be very careful about that is what my advice would be. I, I agree with you um, mostly with what you said. The only thing that I'll say is I think that you got to make sure that you're authentic. So, you know, I think that showing your failings or talking about an, a piece that really didn't work or something that you're struggling with, if you can present it in a way that's engaging, I think making your social media as engaging as possible versus just like a, a passive, I hope I get a lot of thumbs up, but really trying to incite real uh, comments or, or, or um, dialogue, that's certainly how you're going to work the Facebook algorithm to get in front of more people. So thinking about ways that you can use your social media to engage, not just celebrate yourself or your work or your brand, um, I think that that's a real key to, to, to staying in front of, of people's news feeds. Does that make I sense? I absolutely agree. Engagement is critical. My only concern, somebody Googles your name, they find your Facebook page. The first thing they see is a half-cooked painting in it that can impact your reputation. No, again, I think it's it's a real careful nuance because you're both trying to create an online persona, but the second that you don't seem real or authentic, you could start losing people. So you have to it's a it's a careful balance of of not being too polished and and showing your 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 flaws or your true self or some version of that true self, um, but not putting material out there that, like you said, is going to end up coming to bite you. I think that social media is is essential and it is not simple you know we're going to be doing a panel together on stage uh at the plein air convention where we're talking about the state of the plein air industry but let's give people a little, little bit of a sneak peek right now what what are some of the uh the things that are on your mind Oh, man, I think it is a real exciting time. And I think that there is a lot of conversation about and, and it's not new conversation, but it's taking on new, new life, which is what is plein air painting and how how can it be uh, specifically defined? You know, if you go and paint in the same location outdoors for multiple days, is that plein air? Does it have to be a loose study? How big can a plein air painting be? How abstract can it be? How photorealistic can it be? I think that there's a lot of like pendulum swinging about those de definitions right now. Certain, That's exciting conversation. Certainly a trend that we have seen over the last several years is towards more abstraction. Yeah. And yeah, I think that that's kind of an exciting direction. It and certainly it's has not, a lot of our collectors excited. And, and it's not necessarily something that everybody should just glom onto. You know, you should paint your painting every time. But the it, but it does sort of come into this question of what is plein air. Yeah, we chose a long time ago to define what is not plein air and then leave the door wide open for people to interpret, yeah, as an artist, what it is. So, you know, we say that, yeah, if you have a painting that is going to be called a plein air painting, then the subject was in front of you to the point where it is substantially complete. And yeah, if you didn't do that, then it's not a plein air painting. And anything else, we really don't have stylistic lines. We let people paint inside. Yeah, we let yeah yeah any sort of yeah you know, approach that the artist yeah you know, has yeah you know, is is fine with us. And, and yeah, as people go out there and innovate and do yeah you know, interesting things. Yeah, if they work, other artists start to get excited about it too. 
and go and interpret in a in that same you know, direction, but with their own voice. And I think that that's really exciting. You know, I don't think plein air is a static thing. No. And I think that the it's state of the the state of the you know plein air in a larger sense is yeah made better by artists going out and truly being creative and innovative. Diversity. Yeah. Right? One of the things that has really been you know, true for Plein Air Easton is because we have this concentration of really talented people and because winning a prize at Plein Air Easton is not easy to do. Yeah. Um, the, the sort of pressure to, yeah, to put your best work out there has created a whole lot of innovation yeah, um, you know, the one of the things that really happened when Plenary Easton became a big event in the country and there started to be some really large paintings. Yeah, people started painting larger you know, around the country, not just uh, in, in Easton. You know, we, we certainly saw that with yeah, one of the years it was particularly hot and there were a whole bunch of nocturne paintings that happened largely because the daytime was just so darn yeah, hot. Miserable. Yeah. But yeah, um, suddenly you started seeing nocturne paintings all over the place. Um, I, you know, I think that, yeah, the, the thing that will make plein air painting successful over time is not, yeah, looking down at the person who is just starting out, but giving them a hand up really yeah creating content yeah across all the festivals that are yeah that are helping the people that are just getting going to figure it out and maybe become the next yeah yeah big big deal you know we have watched people who really in the very beginning couldn't get in year upon year upon year and they didn't and they didn't and they didn't and then you know and this is one where I will um will call him out actually yeah Jason Sakran tried to get into Plein Air Easton for a number of years, and the year that he did, he won the grand prize. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, um, you know, the, the guy had the had all the talent that was necessary, but yeah, you know, it it doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of work, and and and, and I I guess. I I would just like just add add one more thing to what Al is saying because I think that you know in in what's the next step for the for the modern plein air movement thinking of and creating more events that are inclusive and help to build audiences collectors and artists themselves you know I think that we need more of those opportunities not less I've been really sad in the last few years to see some of the the regional festivals here in in Maryland um take a break or decide that they they're not going to continue forward I think it is it's such a loss to our, our state it's a loss of opportunities for artists to come and participate and the, the less the less, um, the fewer events and paintouts and competitions and workshops and classes there are, the less people are getting excited about plein air painting. So I just think that that as a community, we need to work on ways to to support one another and and, and create new ideas for for inclusion and bringing people in into this just really fun and awesome um, um, way of producing paintings. Well, and not everybody has to go out and make their living as a painter. I mean, the you know, the majority of plein air painters are hobbyists and they can still go to plein air events and enjoy them and participate in some cases. And, and that's pretty wonderful. Absolutely. Again, it's about finding joy in, in, in art. I'm going to go back to the mission of the Avalon Foundation where we started, where we're about building healthy, happy, vibrant communities. And, uh, you know, I will argue to the mats that what create what, what makes a healthy, happy community is how active the art scene is there. I mean, it is the one thing that can bring you just pure joy with no other expectations. And 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 professional artists who are feeling threatened by someone like me picking up a paintbrush, you got to be out of your mind. Like I, there's no part of me that wants to ever be a professional painter. I don't actually want to ever pick up a paintbrush, to be honest. But like if, if I did, you know, if people are looking to find joy and fulfillment and you can help them help them achieve that, they're not coming after your job. They're looking to be in, inspired. Often by you. <laughs> you know, the majority of artists uh, who paint in plein air are really giving people, you know, they've all been there. They all started out doing 
really crummy paintings. And then they, they got better and better. And we really saw this a community of people come to the rescue of everybody else at the plein air convention last year because and the year before too because of the podcast a lot of new people are discovering plein air paintings some of them have painted but never plein air painted some of them had a- actually shown up probably had 50 people showed up that had never even painted before and the artists are just right there for them and they're saying let me help you let me give you some guidance let me show you how to do this and, you know, that's the spirit of giving. And that's what's so wonderful about being around this group of people. Uh, you know, this is all about the spirit of the community. These people are, are really happy doing what they're doing and they're there to help. Right. It's, it's really true. No, I think that um, I have several objectives. Part of it is about making a community that really values yeah, art. And that's a, yeah, I think I, I'm thinking back right now to a conversation that I had uh, with Camille Preswatic. And she said 90% of being a plein air painter is something that anyone can learn. Yeah, the last 10% is what separates the really great artists from the ones that are just, yeah, technically proficient. And, uh, but like it is a eminently teachable thing. And that, yeah, in the, our culture, we, we say that, yeah, oh, I can't draw. I'm a terrible artist. Yeah, people give that excuse and they sort of laugh it off. And she said, can you imagine if a person came up to you and said, ha, 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 I'm illiterate. Yeah, nobody would accept that as a, as a, a you know, yeah, ex- as, a, as a real answer. Um, you know, the person that is just getting started is learning the, the language of art and the skills that are necessary. And, and, you know, from my perspective, I think that there are an awful lot of people out there that you know, are never going to write sh- you know, prose like Shakespeare, but better be able to read and write. And you know, that's sort of how I see the you know, the person that picks up the paintbrush and, and is just getting going. Yeah, as long as they are deriving real meaning from in their life from producing artwork, and they're learning about what is what does make the greats the greats. Yeah, I think that that is totally fine and acceptable. You know, again, they're not necessarily going to ever be the ones that win a grand prize at Plenary Easton. Again, you but, don't pick up a but, golf club because yeah, you think but, you want to go to the but Masters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is that precise notion of as long as you're deriving joy in it, you should be yeah, engaging and we should be welcoming you. Oh, you're absolutely right. We have this sense in our culture that – you know, we, we say, well, you're an artist, you must have had that naturally born, right? And and yet, we don't say that about a musician, a pianist, or a brain surgeon, or anybody else, but for some reason, we think that it comes natural to be an artist, when really, if it comes natural, it's because you're working really hard at it, you're just working it, you're constantly practicing, you're constantly drawing, constantly painting, and, th- and that's what really makes the difference. How many yeah, times do you think we've heard after our quick draw competition what you want $2,500 for that that you did in an hour and a half or two hours? That's crazy. Right. And it's like you're not paying for what what happened in that hour and a half. You're paying for the uh, 40 years that it took you to be able to do that in, in, in two hours. Well, I'm really looking <laughs> forward to having the two of you on stage with some others, and we're going to talk about the state of the plein air convention. And in the... And in the meantime, I would just say that, you know, um, anybody who is, is finding joy in listening to your podcast should consider coming and celebrating the 15th year of Plein Air Easton this year. We're cooking up more content than we have maybe in the 15 years combined. We've got a lot of really exciting announcements that are going to be made in the next couple of weeks. So I would just really encourage everybody to, to go online and check out um, pleinaireaston.com, see the artists that are participating this year. But also keep an eye out for the 
the opportunities where you can come and bring your paintbrushes and participate um, and make those connections here in Easton this year. I, we're calling it a homecoming. We're inviting a lot of our alumni to come participate. And, you know, we're just really excited to be able to to celebrate 15 years from a place of real gratitude for all the people who helped us be successful for so long. And it, it's hot, but it's super fun. So I hope someday, Eric, you get to come and experience it for yourself. And in the meantime, I would say to your listeners, you know, check us out on Facebook, on Instagram, flip through, see the kind of art that's created and, and come and say hey to, to Al or I when you uh, come to the Eastern Shore of Maryland in July. Well, that was a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always good for that. But I, I think you're right. And I, and I would encourage people to check it out. It is definitely a premier event, uh, probably one of the premier events in, in America, if not the premier event. And um, man, I hope I get to go there this summer. Secondly, I think that the two of you have really exhibited great leadership in this community of plein air painters, not only just in Easton, but your, your willingness to embrace and help others around the country, help other events. That really says a lot about the spirit of what you're really trying to create. I, I don't think that people really understand how much work goes into this and, and how much the two of you and your organization have contributed to the overall success of the plein air painting movement. And um, I just want to say publicly, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you for, for the kind words. You know, I think that hard work is not really very hard when you're passionate huh. about it. So, um, you know, when, when Jess and I first got into this, you know, 15 years ago, yeah, we didn't really have any idea of what it would all become. I was just out of high school, but, just for the record. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Um, but, you know, when, when we saw, you know, how people were responding, it really did, you know, highlight the potential for this event and, you know, and these kinds of events to, to form the community that we've seen blossom over these years. And, you know, it's really gratifying to, to, you know, not only to you know, sort of enjoy the landmarks that you know, yeah, that or benchmarks rather that that you know, we've achieved, but to to watch across the country at how I think that plein air festivals are getting better, um, and it is because we're all in it together and we're sharing yeah, that, that that that's the case. So, um, and we're grateful to you, Eric, and to your um, publications and events who that continue to innovate and create a forum for artists to get together and for us to be able to talk about what it is that we're doing and feeling passionate about. So um, thanks for this opportunity and, and for the praise. We're, we're grateful to be in it all together. Well, and you're doing a wonderful job. So thank you, Jessica and Al, for being on the Plein Air Podcast. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Thank you again to Jess and Al. I love these people. They're really, really bright. And I, I think they've done so much for the plein air world probably more than we could ever imagine. They've been, had such a positive influence. They've brought so many people through the show. They've had, uh, we talked about, you know, lots and lots of people who've come to these shows who have become painters. So that's pretty cool too. Well, should we do some marketing stuff now? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions, and you can always email me, eric at plenairmagazine.com, with your questions. Here is a question from Catherine in Emeryville, California. She says, I'm an artist who's trying to figure out how to get more done, aren't we all? I have kids in school, me too, a husband, I don't have one of those, and I'm caring for my elderly parents. Yikes. Though I know that's a lot, I made a decision that I need to be marketing and selling my artwork. And my paintings, uh, I still have to have time to do them too. And I'm making some decent progress, but I think I'm probably wasting a lot of time. You seem like you've got a lot going on. How do you get so much done? Do you have any tips on organizing my time? Well, Catherine, uh, thank you for the compliment. I get a lot done because I have a really killer staff. I have a, a group of people who just... They just are relentless. They just never, they never stop. They're, they're wonderful people. I'm honored to have them, and I would be nowhere without any of them. So, you know, it may look like I'm getting a lot done, but it's really they're getting a lot done. Now, I do get some stuff done, and I'll tell you how I do it. 
I think you're a living example of the idea of if you want something done, give it to a busy person. You know, it all starts with your attitude. You have the right attitude, Catherine. Most of us would probably tell ourselves to wait till our kids were grown or our parents were gone. And so congratulations for not letting anything roadblock you. I think that's a first step, a great first step. Time management is part of marketing. It certainly is about running a business. I've taken several courses over the years. I have a system that I use that works for me. I've combined a lot of things I've learned over the years. You know, there's a lot of courses on time management on things like Udemy or, um, oh, probably, you know, just surf around. You can find something. But my system, I'll tell you about that. We all have things that are important to get done. We have things that are urgent to get done, but they're not important. And we have things that have to get done no matter what. So, you know, you have to have that fine balance. I work on a system. We identify what we call our big rocks. We, at the beginning of the year, we set our big rocks, which are kind of like big goals. What are, what are the two or three big things we want to get done for the year? We never try to do more than two or three things. Now, I have several companies, so we have some big rocks for each of those companies. But the idea is to set big rocks, two or three big things, and then break them out into quarterly rocks. You know, what are the things that we have to get done this quarter that will make sure that rock is done by the end of the year? And then we allow ourselves, um, you know, two or three per quarter each. That's about it. You know, so we'll assign those things, you know, two or three rocks to one or two people. And then, of course, our to-do lists get pretty long that have to relate to those rocks. But, you know, if you want to get things done, we can spend all of our time on busy work. We can spend all of our time managing and doing things on a to-do list and not be any further ahead at the end of the year. And the goal is you want to be further ahead. So you've got to ask yourself, what's going to move the needle? What is going to take you the furthest? You know, it might be marketing. It might be advertising. It might be, you know, some very specific things that are going to move the needle. It might be a show. You know, there are a lot of things. Well, to do a show, you know, you, you can't just instantly show up with 120 paintings or 20 paintings or whatever the number is. You've got, Probably not 120. That's a lot of paintings. But anyway, the idea here is that, you know, you've got to break it out and plan it. Sometimes these things take a couple of years or longer. So what I do is I try to create a weekly list. I usually do it on a Friday afternoon or a Monday morning. I say, okay, what do I want to get done next week? And I look at my list of rocks to see if I'm making progress and see what I have to do. Then I break it into small chunks that are manageable and doable. You know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So then I break them into this weekly list, and then I get it into a daily list, right? So here's something related to my rocks that I want to get done today. The problem with to-do lists is they all get very long, and most of the things that are on the list never get done. I have, for years, had these massive long to-do lists, and it's overwhelming. And so finally, what I started doing is I just have a place I put all the projects that I want to consider doing, but things that I'm not necessarily doing now. And so I'll put them there, and I'll evaluate them once a quarter. Do I want to do that this quarter? But stick to the things that are going to move you forward. Now, I take my list, and I break it out into A's, B's, and C's. And there's also what I call urgent. Urgent, I'll put an asterisk next to it. So I might have a C. It's really not very important, but it's urgent to get it done. You know, maybe I've got to pay a bill or something. I have to get it done today. So uh, normally, I don't even work on Bs and Cs. They just kind of get pushed away and eventually get elevated to As, or they get pushed back to the list that never, never sees the light of day again. And so I focus on my As. So then I take my A's and I number them. I've got, I'll go through it and I'll say, okay, what's the most important thing on this list today? What's the most important thing that relates to the big rock that I've got to get done? And I'll give that an A1, and then I'll give the next thing an A2 and so on. And then um, what I also do is I have to figure out how to manage my energy, right? Like um, I have, you know, I'm my best early in the morning, and so like, after lunch, I kind of go downhill, which probably means I'm eating too many carbs. But I want to work on the things that take the most energy and the most brain power when I have it. So I kind of try to plan my day based on my energy. So I need a clear head if I'm doing a lot of writing. Um, I don't need a real super clear head if I'm in a lot of meetings. You know, So I kind of try to schedule the meetings into my lower energy times, and I try to get the writing in my high energy times, right? 
And of course, as a painter, you know what what your best times are. Maybe mornings are your best time. Maybe evenings. You got to figure that out. And of course, you have the uh, you have to balance, you know, your parents and your kids and school and food and all those other things that you have to do, chores. And so, uh, you know, that makes it tougher. And you're probably not going to get a full day of work in like the rest of us because of all the stuff that you have to do. But basically, what I do is I set two times a day that I check my email. Now, I violate that some days. I will have some days, if I've been gone for a day or two, I'll spend a full day or two full days just getting caught up in email. And I have an assistant who's going through most of my email and checking it and, and uh, only getting things to me that I need to absolutely see because there's a lot of routine stuff that team members send to me that I don't really need to see and so on. Anyway, I check my email from uh, first hour in the morning and the last hour in the evening. And I try not to check any other time. I try to stay disciplined. I try to stay off social media. If I get a Facebook message, I go there. But the problem is, if I go there, next thing you know, I'm sucked in and I'm watching a bunch of stuff on social media and burning time. So I try to stay away from it. Attack your list in between your email times. And so go after the urgent things. Work on A1 till it's done. Stay focused. Stay off the phone. Stay off email. Just do it. Because the thing that happens is we lose our momentum, right? You work on something, you walk away from it for a little while, you can't remember, you have to get up to speed again. So you want to be efficient. Anyway, I hope that helps. Uh, it certainly has helped me. Next question is from Keith in Savannah, Georgia. Hi, Keith. Nice to hear from you. Um, let's see, Eric, with all the events out there, I think I'm ready to try to get invited to some of them. What should I do? Well, Keith, I assume you mean plein air events. Um, my old standby is find out if you're ready. Ask somebody who will tell you the truth, somebody who you respect. It might be a fellow painter, might be a gallery owner. Find out if you're ready because your friends and family, your close friends and family, or your mother will tell you that you, you are the best painter in the world, and you might be, but it's nice to get validation from the outside that you're ready. Second thing is that being in performance mode and having to crank out finished paintings fast takes a very special skill that most of us don't have. You know, I can knock out a decent plein air study in a couple of hours, but I'm not so sure it would be, it would pass as a decent finished plein air study. The people who do these shows have a lot of very special skills, and, you know, you got to be able to nail it consistently nine out of ten times, you know, that because you can't survive going, the, going to all these shows if you're doing turkeys. And so, again, get feedback. And you don't want to be at your first plein air event and be in a quick draw and blow it. Word travels fast, and then you don't get invited back. So make sure you're ready. Next, I would say, you know, most events, of course, are juried. Some events want stars who want to draw people to their event. Some events jury some people in and then have a couple of invited artists. But think, think about what these people want. If they want stars who are going to draw people to their event, then you have to become known. And the way to become known is to get written up in articles, get a lot of press, get a lot of publicity, do a lot of advertising, do a lot of branding. And if you do those things, it works like magic, and then you're really ready for it. So it will help you a lot. Of course, it will help you in other ways, too. You get invited into galleries and other such things. I think it's a good idea to attend events, get a feel for them. If they allow it, paint along on the days they allow it, have interaction with other artists, ask questions uh, of other artists who are in shows about what their experiences are like. And the last, I want to tell you to be careful what you ask for. The artists who are doing these events are very special people. And what I mean by that is they're working really hard. They're often away from their families for weeks at a time. Some will do 10 or 15 shows a year. They're never home. They're exhausted. They're on the road all the time. They're driving to these events. They don't get a chance to work on their studio paintings or the other business aspects of their lives. And it seems very glamorous, and it can be, but it's a lot of work. And if the collectors realized how hard these artists work to be at these events, every painting would sell. I'm telling you, they, if they knew how hard these people worked, but of course nobody wants to tell them that. These people are making sacrifices. So before you go out there and make those sacrifices, make sure that you have a good body of work, that you're good at doing this quickly, 
and that you're willing to be on the road and be away because, you know, these people uh, are putting in the time, and thank goodness they are because it makes these events very special. All right? Hope that helps. Hey, by the way, um, at the Plein Air Convention, I'm going to be doing Art Marketing Boot Camp each of three mornings. Uh, we think it's about $1,000 value, and it's free as a bonus for attending. So this year I'm going to be talking about a couple of things, but one morning I'm going to talk about the $5 million artist who I met and how he got himself to $5 million in sales in three years. I was completely blown away. He broke all the rules, nothing illegal, nothing immoral, uh, but it was very cool how he did it. And I've told a couple of people about it, and they're like rocking it. So this might be something that could apply to you in your marketing. Uh, and by the way, this guy had no special advantages. You know, he didn't have a, a marketing background or, you know, he didn't have any money. It wasn't like he had special things happening for him. But he pulled this off by changing a couple little things in the way he approached things. So that's just something I'll be talking about at the convention. Also, don't forget to enter the plein air salon because it's gonna time's gonna run out. You got to get that done like today. So as soon as you're done with this podcast, go to plenairsalon.com and enter. All right. Hey, it's been fun being with you guys today. Make sure you check out my Sunday coffee blog. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com, and you can subscribe, and it'll come to you on Sunday mornings. I love doing podcasts. I love being with you. Thank you to everybody who's been listening. I hear from people all over the world, and I hear from people who say, you know, I listen when I paint, I listen when I drive, I listen when I'm going to events, you know, a lot of different places that you listen. And so I, I'm really honored that you would bring me into your home or your car or your studio, and it's just a big honor that you would listen. So thank you very much. My name is Eric, Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine, which, of course, you can find on the newsstands if you've not seen it. We like it. It's pretty cool. Anyway, remember, it's a big world out there, and it needs to be painted, and you need to paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.